And with that, hello and welcome to another episode of the Choose Strong Podcast. Eddie and I are very happy that you decided to take us along for your next hour, two hours. As we've said before, we really don't know how long this podcast will be until we upload it. But, you know, that's that's the whole part of the fun, Eddie. It is part of the fun, Sal. You are absolutely correct because when I have to go to the bathroom about 30 minutes in, I might have to hold it for another 90 minutes. Yeah. You know? Are, so. Now, you brought up going to the bathroom right away. <laughs> Do you want to pause right now and run to the bathroom? Well, I'm drinking my uh, LaCroix water, so mm-hmm. anything's possible at this point. You know, I've got my Topo Chico, and for all of our listeners who are big fans of the sparkling water, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's an addictive chemical in it, but I definitely start craving a sparkling water at the end of a long run. We've been ripping through some of this stuff, like, we have. big time. We have. The other day, you walked into the house with four cases of LaCroix, and I was like, wow. Someone... And there's about one case left. <laughs> no, like, That's a lot. Yeah, we've already probably gone through three. Yeah. When when stuff. we when we were kids though, the only sparkling water that we knew about was like tonic water. Yeah. You know, soda water. That we didn't want any part of that. No. No. Nope. That was we would go outside and just get the the hose water. Right. Yeah. Do kids drink from the hose today? I don't think so. I don't that's probably they're probably not allowed to. Yeah, water's different. Hey, we want to give a shout to our kids right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, we are waving at you, and and we are so happy you're here. In fact, we are going to hop straight into a pumpkin segment just for the kids because we know the kids don't hang around for as long as our uh, grown-up friends do. But this had Eddie and I rolling we are going to put up some pictures. Mm-hmm. Was, was Did she send you videos too? Is it all just, just pictures? Just pictures, yeah. Yeah. So Eddie, I'm going to let you take this away because this is both entertaining and it's a tag back on last week's episode. Yeah. So or last- two, week, two weeks ago, I think it was. Two weeks. I don't know. Last week, two weeks. One of the episodes prior, the pumpkin, like, you had a question for me, right? How big, how heavy do you think the heaviest pumpkin is? is or was and i guessed something way off like 800 pounds was your guess 600 something but but 2000 plus was like the you know so we started chatting about this so anyways we got an email this week and we got some uh a listener and her name is vanessa vanessa i'm just going to read this email because this is hilarious and says super random on your podcast about the giant pumpkin but Seriously, my husband actually grows giant pumpkins and has been for over 20 years. It's amazing. So I had to share this and the photos with you both. I've grown a few giants, but mine have never exceeded 800 pounds. Okay, that's epic right there, even 800. I enjoy more of the pumpkin regatta scene where you carve out the inside of a giant pumpkin and race it in a lake or a pool. Okay, it's paused. Okay, paused. Okay. When you first read that to me, yeah. because you might have to read that again. Okay, I will do that I have again. I never heard about this in my life. I had to picture it, but just say again. Okay. <laughs> I enjoy more the pumpkin regatta scene where you carve out the inside of a giant pumpkin and you race it in a lake or a pool. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, are we going to throw uh, up the pictures right now yes. of what that looks like? Check because it out. Eddie was reading this to me, and then I, I I could not stop laughing. I didn't think this was real. He shows me these pictures that you're seeing on the YouTube right now, and I pretty it's impressive. amazing. I want to do it. it would, I want like who says that they get to do that? Like I, who came up with this idea? No, uh, my question is <laughs> how. Maybe this is directed to Vanessa. How do you get into something like that? You know, like that's my. My my, I've always had a question. I've always had this question. I still don't know the answer. Like, how do you get into opera singing? Like, how do you know that? Like, you know what? I'm really good at opera singing. Like, when do you find that out? Like, <laughs> so when true. do you know? Like, you know. Anyways, kind of random, but I, I feel like it's the same thing. Like, how do you get into reg- the gr- regatta scene where you're hollowing out pumpkins to race them? Anyways, she said she goes on her email. She says I have done it many times at a pumpkin way off. <laughs> that we used to attend in Cooperstown, New York. I was actually featured on the Wild World of Sports kayaking a giant pumpkin back in 2010. Oh, my gosh. Okay, that is a great show. I used to watch that. And they did have some pretty wacky 
sports, and this is de- definitely one of them. So it's such a fun hobby. My husband, Kevin, he grows his pumpkins in Grampian, Pennsylvania. The largest pumpkin that he has grown was 2,140 pounds back in 2022. He is known for growing the prettiest pumpkins, which in the giant pumpkin world is known as the Howard Dill Award, which he has won many, many times. This year, he became the champion squash winner, weighing (laughs) in at 695 pounds. Okay, we're going to pause right there. So not only does her husband win awards for growing the prettiest pumpkins, on top of that, they're over a ton. Mm -hmm. They, They weigh over a ton. I wish that we would have asked this before, figure this out. Yeah. Are those naturally grown? Hmm. Good question. I mean, that, that is massive. So he, he grows the prettiest pumpkins. On top of it being a pretty pumpkin, it weighs over a ton. And then he enters another category with the squash. And I know we're, we're seeing all these pictures right now. So here's our, you know, you, you've seen the squash picture. I think that's a green. I don't know what that. Yeah. It, it's huge. Like, what do you do with that? I mean, do you, do you cut that up and freeze it? Do you have squash for the next 365 days a year? Do you do you well, turn it into pasta and sell it to your neighbors? Well, I don't know anything about this, obviously. <laughs> but, like, when you put the pumpkin seeds in the ground, right, and you water it and you, mm-hmm. you know, you hope it grows. Yeah, tell us about growing a pumpkin. Agriculture, yeah. So any anytime <laughs> you want to grow something that's from the ground, you put a seed in. I used to teach like second grade, so I oh, know okay. how to do this. I, well, pardon uh, me. Yeah, so <laughs> back off, all right? So, uh, anyways, I, my question is like when you put it in the ground and you begin to water it, like what, what would make my pumpkin different than yours, I guess is what I'm saying. Like how would you get a, a pretty pumpkin versus an ugly pumpkin on my end if we're just – I don't know. Is it the soil? Is it, soil. Is it what you're feeding the the soil? Like, how does that dictate the pumpkin soil, seed? Soil is a vital part in all of that. Like, where are you laying your roots? Okay. <laughs> okay. Look let's, at you. Let's talk about this for a Look minute, all right? Let's go and tag that back into life. <laughs> oh, like, okay. all right, where are you planting your seeds and where are you going to grow your, you know, your vegetables? I think the soil has a lot, you know, it has a lot to do with that. So you think it's just soil? Well, obviously, there's there's a lot of different pieces that go into growing fruit and vegetables. It, yeah. But the dirt is – that's the foundation, you know? So what is the foundation in which you grow something? Yeah, and he grows them in Pennsylvania. Maybe that mm-hmm. has, like, some, like, special soil. I'd suffice it to say that Pennsylvania dirt's a lot better than the dirt in our backyard here. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Uh, next to the ocean. 100%. Um. Yeah, that's a fun. I mean, we're we're gonna get a lot of farmer emails yeah. here uh, in the next week, and the good thing that you know, good thing, Eddie. Yeah, we love this stuff. Oh, so you know, go ahead and send it our way because we it. are curious, and we do. We we were sitting around the la- the living room laughing about this, and we were just like, no way. We are absolutely opening up our next podcast with this because it's fascinating. Yes, it's something that not a lot of people know about. Yeah. Um, I think at some point when we are kids in elementary school, we hear about the biggest pumpkin. Like, But the fact that someone decided, see that 800-pound uh, pumpkin over there? I'm going to hollow that out. Mm. I'm going to put it in the water. <laughs> I'm going to get an oar, yeah. and I'm going to get to their side of the lake. I mean that's that's and amazing. Who it. is the first person that thought of that? I that's mean, I, I just yeah. talk about using your resources in the best possible way. So if you don't have a boat but you do have a pumpkin, hey, I got some downtown down <laughs> downtime later. You know what I'm googling? <laughs> what I'm gonna watch on YouTube is some uh, hollowed out pumpkin racing. <laughs> Good stuff. I just, Good stuff. I want to say thank you to, is it Vanessa? Vanessa, thank yeah. you for entertaining us. Thank you for providing so many pictures. Yes. Eddie and I learned a lot, and uh, we know that all of our listeners, uh, you know, both listening, but also those on YouTube that were able to see the pictures, we enjoyed it. That was a really fun part of this episode. Yes, that was. This episode is brought to you by Ketone IQ, a clean shot of energy with no sugar or caffeine. When you take this in the morning or before a workout, You just feel more focused and energized in a good, non-jittery way. In fact, Ketone IQ, they work with top Olympic athletes like Des Linden to Michael Andrews to Ironman world champion Sam Laidlow. They also just launched a supplement and research partnership with Team Visma 
Lisa Bike. You can save 30% off your first subscription order and receive a free six pack of Ketone IQ when you visit ketone.com backslash Sally. That's K E T O N E dot com backslash S A L L Y. All right. So I'll break this down, break it down. Mm -hmm. Break it down right now. The quick summary of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. So today I think is a really important part of the year. If you are listening to this uh, around the time that we have released it, today is, uh, it's October 2024. And typically this is, uh, you know, October, November kind of marks, you know, we're moving toward the end of the year. Uh, For those of you that like to race and compete, not everyone that listens to this podcast, that's, that's not what we expect everyone to be into, but you know, this is, this is where the season is ending. And one of the questions that we have been asked is, you know, what does an off season look like? Mm -hmm. And what do you do in an off season? What are the benefits? So that's really what we are going to break down today. I am particularly going to focus on strength training in the off season and why it's not only valuable to you, but why it is important for everyone, whether or not you race. So, uh, you know, for the, the everyday person that is just trying to keep a strong, healthy body, you know, what, why should I construct a plan that has an off season in it. And what does that look like? For those of you that like to train and like to race throughout the year, why would you pick a few months or a few weeks where, where you have an off season? What are the benefits of that? So um, that is what we will be talking about today. Good stuff. So we have some good tips, good ideas, great inside. Um, and of course, we'll end with some encouragement. As always, yes. as always, yeah. Sally bringing the, bring the heat at the end. <laughs> All right, Sal, I'm going to uh, share. I just chose one today because the pumpkin update was pretty funny. That was great. Uh, and that was a, a cool thing to share. But I have uh, I have Devin here in Strava, and uh, he wrote that he ran two marathons this past weekend. Oh, wow. Super pumped with how they both mm-hmm. went. The Like a Saturday, Sunday? Was that the, the challenge or you know, was it just... It's not a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I did, it just I see one of them here, but he said okay. he ran two this past weekend, he said the this one was my second slower of the two, which was four hours and pretty good. Uh, as some of you as some of you know, this next summer I'll be running Alaska from top to bottom, eight hundred sixty miles. So that breaks down to fifty k a day for twenty eight days. Now, the reason I wanted to point this out for Dev and and highlighting this, it's like you know what, fifty k a day for twenty eight days, that's pretty impressive, and. I give some encouragement to those that are planning 150K for the year, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Knowing that some guys are out there running 50K a day for a couple weeks, 28 mm-hmm. days. And uh, Devin, good luck on that, first of all. But uh, I like that because that really is an encouragement to those of us that have got one race on the calendar that might even be less than 50K, a half marathon that, uh, you know, it's it's definitely doable if you're thinking you can't pull off that half marathon. Now he said he's he is doing that from top to the bottom of Alaska. Alaska, yes. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, my insane. my mind is immediately going to how rugged. Yeah. And isolated and wild that state is. Yeah. Um. That is is does he is he doing it solo? Is he, uh, he a team with him? He doesn't say, but. I mean, it's 860 miles. So, wow, and if it's incredible. going to take 28 days, that's 28 days in the in the thick of it. That's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. You think of like being safe and mm-hmm. having a team. Obviously, is probably mm-hmm. something that he has. Um, yeah, and yeah, that's uh, yeah. Like you said, that terrain is no joke. The animals mm-hmm. are no joke. The, yeah, it's a lot to. That's a lot to navigate. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's that's incredible, Devin. We will be thinking of you. Yeah. And oh, did he? Is he already doing it? No, he... no. It says uh, he's gonna do it. Um, oh, okay. Next summer. Oh, yeah. next summer. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, Devin, we just want to wish you all the strength, and uh, strength of body. Most importantly, strength of mind. Yeah. Uh, because that's that's really what it's about in those longer distances. The multi-day events is, you know, you gotta 
you got to have some strong focus, some strong uh, mental toughness there to endure what he he's going to endure. So we are rooting for rooting you. Rooting for you, Devin. Yeah, I don't and, know where Devin lives, but yeah. I mean, this run was from Massachusetts that okay. he did this past weekend. So I don't know if he's from Massachusetts and then running in Alaska, which m- would make it even more insane because yeah. he's not too familiar with the Alaskan. Yeah, yeah. The Alaskan really terrain. Cool. Anyways, thought that uh, that'd be cool to highlight. Mm-hmm. And uh, all right. Let's let's dive into just the meat Let's of today's podcast because I think that the third part uh, there's three parts that I'm I'm going to discuss today and the the hope is just to really focus on strength training yeah. as a whole and hopefully take away some confusion and hesitation just about strength training. So I I know there's a lot of messaging out there. There's a lot of ideas about it. There's thousands of plans and different ways that you can tackle it. Um, But basically, I'm I'm just going to talk about why you should strength train and and the benefits, how to specifically create a season of strength building. And then I'm going to just very lightly touch on how to continue making strength training a part of your year-round training. But ultimately, that's going to be a subject for a future podcast. Because as I uh, stated earlier, this is more about strength training in the off season. And that is a space that a lot of us are about to enter. Um, It's also a season that is something that people are a little confused about. Mm -hmm. And I notice that every year when I start sharing about my off season. So there's like the off season and then there's like the base building season. So like the off season flows into the base building and they're kind of similar. Uh, and that's, I want to break that down and hopefully, uh, you, the, the takeaways that you will have today is just a little bit more clarification and hopefully some confidence to tackle strength training in a way that best fits you and your goals and your lifestyle. So, um, so basically let's just kind of like talk about what is an off season. And I'm, I'm actually going to add a, another adjective to that, just a new season. So off season, a lot of times I think is attached to athletes. It's something they do when they end their baseball season, their soccer season. Eddie, you remember this when we were in college and typically we knew that when we were entering off season, we got a break. Yeah. We got a break from the typical rigid structured training the grind yeah the grind that we know for most of our year mm-hmm. and so by definition typically an off season is characterized by increased rest and reduced intensity mm. i'd also like to just let me highlight again this this new this new season and an an off season a uh, recovery season it doesn't need to be marked by a race. Mm. It's just a simple change in your fitness routine where you do take down intensity, where you kind of open up that grip you have on structure and you release that a little bit and you allow your body and your mind to have a break. And this is something that's been important to me most specifically, I'd say like starting six, about six or seven years ago. Because when I first started ultra running and at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, it was year round. It was year round training, year round racing. I think it's very easy if you are constantly online, it seems like there's always a race going on. Mm -hmm. And even professionally, there's like a, a new series like every other month that people are working toward in the, in the competitive world. So it can kind of feel like there is no off season. And I decided this was after the first, it was like 2017, 2018. So it was after the first time I raced Badwater that I, I told myself, I am going to take a focused off season because every year I'm trying to get better at what I do. I want to gain strength. Um, we are learning more and more that is, that is it's in our rest that we are able to recover so that we can become stronger, so that we can build again. It's easy to always want to be building. We want to always feel like we're making gains year round. Mm -hmm. 
it's uh, in in some ways a little bit of our pride gets in there. Yep. Because I always want to know that I'm fast. I always want to know that I'm strong. I always want to know that I have that stra that Strava course record, and that every time I get to the start line, that I'm going to do well. And we want that feeling 365 days of the year. And so I just I want to highlight that that one this is a uh, a very a shared human desire. We want to be strong and fit and healthy all the time. Now, there are four seasons in a year, and there are five days in the work week ish. <laughs> yeah, depending on where you live in the world. We have vacation days, and then for those who race, there are taper weeks, there's down weeks, there's recovery weeks. When we get injured or sick, there's a period of healing and rebuilding. We, whether we want to or not, we live our lives in seasons, and there's a time and a season for everything. And if we can embrace each season is valuable, that is how we're able to continue to build. That's how we're able to continue to grow. And so the idea of a structured off season is a natural beneficial time period where you're preparing yourself to make gains in the future, whether that be to train for a race or just to start like a regimen fitness training plan. So let's say that you, you know, you want to get in, you know, January 1st, 2025, you want to join an orange theory studio. Mm -hmm. Like you, you want to do like a 90 day challenge there. Like that, that sounds super fun. Some of your neighbors do that. That's regimented, focused, structured training. Same thing. If you were to join a yoga class or the local basketball, you know, rec league there, there's structure in that. And I think that's good. But a time to lay a foundation and to prepare ourselves for what's ahead is vital. And I think that as a competitive athlete, I spent many years a little confused about what that looked like. So for me, it was like my, my recovery was just immediately after my race. And what ends up happening, and we do see this in sports, is we get too little rest and it's only a matter of time that then the chronic injuries set in or the chronic you know, fatigue sets in, um, the lack of motivation, because the body wants to rest. It wants to recover. Yeah. So um, as I said, I, I started implementing a true off-season cycle about six or seven years ago, and it was a game changer because – you know, I used to race year round. I'd go, go, go. And now I typically take my off season, like the end of fall, winter time. And I like to do like a few weeks of rest. And then I go into like a strength cycle with cardio is kind of being supplemental. Mm -hmm. So it's flexible. So here's what's highlighted in that off season, you guys. It's flexible. It's low stress. So when I say low stress, I'm really highlighting the mental side of that. And I'm not hyper-focused on what's my pace, what is the mileage, perfectly structured workouts. It's flexible. It's low stress. And it also allows me to throw in activities I typically don't do throughout my regular training because – you know, it as my job, my regular training tends to be twice a day and most days of the week and for long hours. And so it's very focused on what it is that I'm training for. So other exercises or, uh, you know, other types of, of training that I might not work into my year round training could be like yoga, stand up paddling. I mean, aerial fitness. Yeah. <laughs> I just kidding, I haven't done that. <laughs> But really it's like, that's, that's the time I do that. Like yeah. my off season, I, I allow my body to rest. I listen to it and I usually take a, a couple weeks where I sleep a ton. And if I feel like training, I'll train. If I do not want to train, and this is where I just let my body do whatever I want. I don't train. I won't go to the gym. I do like to keep on moving. During that off season, I might go for a walk. I'll go for a hike or go on a bike ride. If I feel like going to the gym for a couple hours, I will. And there is, there, there's just no structure to it. And I think that that is what actually keeps me pushing year round is because I know that there is rest coming. And 
I believe that that also helps with the injury prevention Hmm. is it isn't just, you know, pedal to the metal the whole time, just revving the engine all the time. You know, I pick and choose where that intensity peaks and I'm very focused on the off season. So I want to really uh, highlight right now just strength training in the off season and how you can roll that into uh, your your base building, that, that foundational uh, season as well. So off season can kind of be whatever you want it to be. And it is characterized by a decrease in intensity, a break from structure, but you are still allowing your body to move around in any way that feels good to you. So ideally you don't want to get back into a training program and and just feel terrible, but it's okay to feel out of shape. It's okay to feel like, yeah, I couldn't go for a 10 mile run right now, but my body isn't just stiff and I haven't moved in a long time. So uh, how I structure my off season training is I'll spend the first couple weeks just totally resting, doing whatever I want. I don't keep track of the days that I'm training or how long that is. Like I don't, I just do what feels good. I then go right into base building. And this is still a a, a time that I see is just off season because it's, it's not structured run training. It's not structured tempo workouts or any of that of what I do throughout the year. The goal then is to focus on getting strong and to lay a foundation that's going to allow me to achieve the goals that I've set for myself. And strength training at its core is something that we all need for our everyday activities, regardless of a a sport that you like to do. You know, Eddie, we talked about it this morning, how from the time you were in high school, Strength training has always been a part of your life. Mm-hmm. It's and mainly because you're a soccer player. So if if you're a soccer player, and for those of you listening, you know that those go hand in hand because soccer, you need to be explosive, you need to be powerful, you need to be strong. Core strength is very important. Uh, being agile and mobile, I mean, all of that. And so uh, the weight room is necessary to be a good soccer player, and. So having that be a part of your life, you know, one of the things that we talked about is when you step away from strength training and what that feels like for you. Yeah, I think I'm, I alluded to it last time, but as soon as I step away from, yeah, like a, a consistent workout program, lifting weights, um, those types of things, I begin to feel it in other areas of my body, right? So uh, my back is a little off or my core definitely is not as strong. And, and and so for me, I'm not ever lifting to like become a bodybuilder. I'm not lifting even like as much as I should, probably should uh, to become faster in a race or whatever. I'm just like lifting because I want to have a healthy body, right? And I want to feel strong. I want to be able to go up the steps and, you know, carry in grocery, like those, the, the life things, right. That mm-hmm. I, that I want to do and, and do well and not, uh, you know, strain at those things. And so, uh, I know when I am not lifting weights, I just feel weak. Like, I just feel like those things are like, they're hard and, and other aches begin to, to kind of creep in. But when I'm in a consistent program or I'm consistently lifting, weights or strength training, like those seem to go away. Um, Mm -hmm. they're not, they're not as noticeable. They might still be there, but they're not as noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about, uh, just what, first of all, what, what I like to do in my off season and my off season has phases as I have just, uh, highlighted. So the first couple weeks is just rest and doing whatever I feel like doing. And in a way it's like vacation for my mind. It's uh, a vacation from the, the intense structured training that I have done throughout the year. So the first couple of weeks is just kind of like whatever I, I want to do. I then roll into a, a strength building cycle. But the the key in this, listeners, is that I still am not 
doing a structured run program. So what I'm sharing right now, this is specific to running. And so the goal for me is to be a strong runner year round. And this is where it starts. It actually starts with an off season. So I've finished racing. I've had a long year of solid, consistent training. I take a couple weeks of just rest, doing whatever I want, sleep in a lot more. I might, I might go to the gym and do some mobility. I might get on a bike. I might go on a walk. I might get up on a stand up, a stand up paddle. And then after a couple weeks, it's like, all right, I'm now going to focus just on strength. Now, this part of my season is one of my favorite parts. And it still, you know, is under that umbrella of the off season because while I'm building strength, I am not focused on a race. I am focused on laying a foundation for everything that I want to do in the following year. The season of strength training, the cycle of building strength is monumental to me because I know that the goals that I have will absolutely break me down. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at 200 mile races, 100 mile races. That, that's a, that's a, a toll on my body. We also have to factor in that for every decade older that we get, especially starting in our thirties, we lose muscle mass. Our metabolism slows down. I mean, we, we have to focus on building strength because we naturally lose it. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to continue to do the same things that I did when I was in my 20s and in my 30s, strength needs to be able to support the body that wants to endure for these long miles. So what does a typical day or a week, I should say, of strength building look like for me? Well, from Monday to Sunday, my goal is to get in anywhere between three and five days in the gym. And what I do in the gym each time is specific. Some days, the only strength training that I am doing is all body weight. And this is a important part of strength training that is often overlooked because when we think of strength training, we just start with heavy weights. And I know there's a lot of research about, you know, out there. I mean, there's so much that we can look at and great programs that are out there with heavy weightlifting. But I think what is important is, is that when you begin a, a season of strength training, you have to assess your body and where it is. When you finish a season of regimented training or you've had a long year of racing, if you don't take the time to assess and examine your unique breakdown or imbalances, those will stay with you and they will continue to compound. And so what I like to do is I first take time doing mobility. I do core exercises. I do a lot of body weight exercises and I might throw in there a little bit of like light dumbbell work. But the goal is first to feel my body. Where are my weaknesses? Where are my imbalances? Where am I strong? And once you assess your own unique body, that is then going to help you build a strength plan that is not only going to allow you to be stronger for your next season, but it's that's how you are going to hold off injury as well. Because a lot of the times injury comes for us because there's a lack of mobility or a lack of strength. And if you can tackle those during your off season strength training, then that is going to pay back big time throughout your entire year. See, one of the issues that I see online is we think that one strength training program, one session, or one style of strength training is going to achieve 
top to bottom strength for all of us. Oh, I was just given this strength plan to do. Um, much like a running customized training plan, you actually do need to customize your strength training as well. Mm. Are there key exercises that we should be doing? Are there uh, great plans out there that you can just pick up and get stronger? 100% yes, there is. However, if you can take a season where you get to have the time to fully assess your body and what your unique needs are and where your your weaknesses are and where you need to work on mobility, that's where the value comes. It is it is not initially how much you can lift. And the thing is, once we start to enter that phase of building up our, our strength and what it is that we need, we also start to learn that our our bodies take on different shape. We build muscle differently. Uh, we, we need different workouts to fit our imbalances and, and what it is that we can handle. And that's like one of my favorite things about the off season. I get to tackle everything that is very specific to me and not focus on a race. So I'm going to give you some examples of a few things that I always have to work on and will for my entire life. So I have, uh, gosh, since the time Eddie has known me, I guess it may even been when I got in that really bad car accident on the freeway. Mm -hmm. So when Eddie and I, we were probably only about a year into our marriage. No, no, no. We were dating. I'm sorry. Yeah. A year into dating. Uh, we were on the 91 freeway here in Southern California and I was following Eddie to his house in my car and I was behind him. I had this little tiny Toyota, um, what was it Celica? like? Celica. Celica. Yeah. yeah. Remember those? And somebody had been shot on the freeway and the freeway speed immediately went from 70 miles per hour to a standstill. It stopped so fast that, and thankfully, Eddie was in the out, very outside lane because we were about to get to our off ramp. Mm -hmm. Eddie slams on his brake, but he knew that I was behind him. And so he wanted to get me rude. So he goes off into the dirt hoping like you know, this will give Sally some room to stop. And I'm slamming really, really hard on my brake. And right as I come up next to him and we lock eyes, I get hit. The guy behind me didn't know anyone was stopping. The guy hits me at 70 miles per hour. My car spins. And I, I remember seeing your face, Ed. Yeah. Just this look of shock and horror. Yeah. And like, I, what can I do? the only thing that I remember in that is the surprise that I wasn't hit again because mm -hmm. I went into another lane. Yep. Now I got severe whiplash from that and my car was totaled. I mean, it was, it was gone mm -hmm. at, after that. Um, but even before that, you know, I grew up as a gymnast and, you know, I've, I've shared in the past, I, I have some funky things in, in my spine, a little, a, a little bit of curve there, even in my rib cage. So, you know, it inhibits 100% uh, breathing in and out. But for me personally, knowing this about my structure, I always need to have a big emphasis on core, on core strength. I got to make sure that my core is strong, the back is strong, and all the muscles around it. So I do spend a lot of time getting my hips and my glutes strong and my abs strong. All that are the surrounding muscles, especially in, in my lower back where that's usually where I experience the most pain. Now for me, if I am not consistently weight training, that's where I feel it. Mm. I feel it in my lower back and sometimes it can shoot up into my neck as well where I have a couple things going on. But man, the stronger I get, I don't even think about that. Yeah. Now that's unique to me. The other thing that is uh, that's unique to me that I will always have to work on is the fact that my stomach has been cut open three times. So I had surgery when I was a baby. I had two emergency C-sections. And so cutting through the muscles of my stomach three times, yeah, there's a, a little bit of weakness there. Hmm. 
And so none of those things do I take as a disadvantage, but it does give me a blueprint on the focus that I need to have, not only in my off season, but I, I get to build a, up a lot of strength in my off season. I get to totally focus on that. But then I also have a plan to stay consistent and maintain that throughout the year. So knowing that you can construct a plan that fits you, I think that's very exciting. Um, one thing that I do want to address in this is if you are like, wow, I, I still have no idea how to construct a training program or where I would start an assessment, scheduling a head-to-toe evaluation with a sports PT, even if it's just a one visit, is very valuable. And they can run you through so many different tests. Uh, yesterday, Eddie, I... Uh, and you know what, we'll go ahead and put this reel on the screen so people can see it on the YouTube. Um, we'll go ahead and put this in the description too. I posted a reel that said strength test and it's just two exercises. It's one of the exercises is a sit and stand on one leg. And the other one is just a squat and reach on one leg. And there's a lot of things going on in both of these. The description I have in this reel, in this really quick video, it's like 13 seconds long showing these two exercises, is it's a way to assess yourself. Do it in front of a mirror. With the sit and stand, What uh, and I worked in a sports PT for a year, and I learned a lot there. I worked with an incredible strength and movement coach for many years. He now trains my daughter, Mackenzie. His name's Steve Newman. He's amazing here in Southern California. But he ran me through a lot. Like the first time I trained with him, he put me through many different tests. And all of that was to assess my balance, my strength, and my coordination. And it's the same thing at a sports PT. They'll do the same thing with you. It's just a head to toe evaluation. It's not stressful. It's not like this hardcore workout or anything, but it's just really looking at how you move and how efficient you are. So I think anytime you put yourself through a test, you allow yourself an assessment and you are completely honest with yourself, you get to take that and you get to get better. You get to build up strength. You get to work on something that is eventually going to benefit you later on in the year. Okay, so that's the foundation of my off-season strength training. I rest. I then start off with body weight strength training and mobility. And all of it is testing and assessing how my body has handled the year. The mobility is incredible too, because a lot of times when I spend, and I in my off season, I spend almost every day doing 10 to 15 minutes of mobility. It's wild every year, uh, the different parts of my body that I'm like, whoa, that is tight. Mm. Like that hip is tight. I, I didn't even know that until, until I started doing the mobility exercise or like that, why is only my left Achilles like super tight or that ankle is very stiff. And those can also be the beginning of an eventual injury if we don't take care of it. Once I kind of establish what my weaknesses, what my imbalances are, what I can work on, I then like to insert some type of weight training plan. And that is something that I do naturally and kind of off the cuff, mainly because um, you know, I've run my fitness business as a, as a trainer and, and a coach since 2007. So this is something that I enjoy that's very fun for me. I love to lift. So I do take my time moving through these cycles. Rest, body, mo body strength, mobility, and now let's throw some big iron around. Now, I lift the heaviest in my off-season. My goal actually is to put on uh, weight. I want to put on muscle weight. And I showcase this, and you can kind of follow it, in the uh, training for a 200-mile race. It's a series on my YouTube channel, which you'll find in the description here. But I kind of document the fact that I wanted to put on muscle because I knew it was going to break down and I was really going to be pushing my body until the end of the 200 mile grand slam. And I was right. I lost, I lost uh, body weight. I lost muscle mass. And then the next year I worked on building that back up again. So it's, it's, it's this constant cycle. And what I like to do, and this is just 
a very summarized uh, glance at how I work with weights is when I walk into the gym, I have a plan of what part of the body I'm going to work on. And it can be as general as today is all upper body. I'm not going to touch lower body. Today, I'm going to work on upper body. And I could go on the stair mill and just kind of warm up for 10 minutes, get my body warm. I could go on a bike. I could walk on the treadmill. I like to do some type of warm up. I'll go do my mobility for 10 or 15 minutes. And then the majority of that time is an upper body. Now, yes, you can get specific. Eddie, I know that uh, what are some of your favorite upper body areas that you like to work on? You know, I'm going in doing chest triceps on one day. Mm Mm-hmm. Next day might be back biceps, mm-hmm. you know, some delts maybe another day. Okay. Shoulders, you know, and then hit some legs maybe, you know. Okay. Now you just listed five different upper body yes. parts. Okay. So when people have said to me in the past, why do you go to the gym so much? Why are you lifting so much? I could spend five days straight just on different upper body muscles. Oh, yeah. And so when I say there's always something to work on, there is, and there's not enough days in the week to hit all those. Yeah. So I like to choose a couple upper body areas. The next day is lower body. The next day could be just core and mobility. The following day is another couple upper body. So this is where it gets fun to me. It becomes like a puzzle. And again, if I have an area that's particularly weak or something that I need to work on, I'll construct a plan that tackles that. And Eddie, what are some of the things that you like to do in your strength training? I know right now you've said this is a season of gain for you, but you just said you might go in and do some upper body, you'll hit um, deltoids, chest, triceps. Are you typically following a structured plan? Where do you come up with the ideas with your exercises? Well, that, I mean, that specifically is, that's called a bro split. <laughs> that's literally what it's called. I love it. Can you break that down? Yeah. I mean, it, it, the idea is you just focus on one like area Mm-hmm. per workout and then the next day you do a different you know chest one day back one day legs one day that's what a, a bro split is mm-hmm. but yeah so from like what i do i mm-hmm. i mean i follow yeah. i like to do like a program mm-hmm. that kind of walks me through that mm-hmm. different exercises yeah yeah because because my my go-to my default would be going and, and doing the same exercises that i like to do over and over and over exactly. so if i have a program that you know, for instance, if like I'm doing like some shoulder machine that I love and I always do it, but I'm doing a program that I'm supposed to use these bands that I would probably never, ever use or the TRX thing. Like mm-hmm. I would never do those on my own, but because it's like this program, you just get a different muscle, like contraction, different movement within that same muscle um, that, you know, it, it helps grow that muscle probably more because you're doing different exercises targeting that same muscle. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that's, I, I, I used to follow a, a program. Mm-hmm. I love that you highlighted that because that actually it leans into another topic that I'm frequently asked about, especially as a woman is, aren't you afraid of getting too big massive, and getting massive? Yeah. And for you, ever since I've known you, you've always strength trained. Mm-hmm. Doesn't look like it, but I kind of have, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it looks like it. I mean, you you have, Hello. yeah. But I one of the things that is important is that we actually understand how long and the hard work it takes to, to really get big. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's, it's, it's solid time in the gym. Mm. So if, and again, I'm going to go back to the runner and, and relate this to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, my goal is to be strong head to toe. I would love to put on muscle weight, but it is very hard to get huge. Yep. I mean, I would have to be in the gym for many hours a day, eating thousands and thousands of calories, yep. 
And that kind of training, it's, it's specific. Now, when, once I start adding in a structured run program, and again, this is going to be a, a, a full topic for another podcast. How are we combining those two? What does that look like? It is difficult to keep that the muscle mass the same as what it was in my off season when I was just primarily building. So what you focus on is what's going to grow basically. So if you are all in on strength training, on, on building, on getting your body stronger, and that is the focus, that's what's going to happen. But if you are focusing on endurance and running further uh, than you ever have, and you just spend four months just doing that, yeah, you're you're going to achieve that. You're going to get better at that because that is the focus. But you can do both. You can be strong and run far. And so the the goal in the off season training is getting strong from head to toe. But I do approach it as a runner a little differently than someone like Eddie, who actually goes in and he does like a full, you know, upper body program, maybe for six weeks where he's focusing on shoulders and deltoids and triceps and chest. And like that, that's the main focus for me. I want head to toe strength. I love to hit lift heavy, but I'm doing something different every single day that I'm in the gym. And there's a little bit of combo in there of, yeah, I'll get like a machine to help me warm up if I want. I'm putting in mobility and stretching. I'm doing body weight. I'm probably working with some bands. But overall, at the end of the strength building season, I'm excited that I've just built a strong foundation to now start an endurance run program. So I'm not going into a bodybuilding program. The goal is to be strong from head to toe. So because my off-season strength training program is also, it's relatively short. At most, it's going to be about six weeks. So from the time I take those couple weeks, I'll do like a couple weeks and then I'll spend about like six weeks like doing whatever cardio I want and really focusing on getting strong. Yeah, we're looking at like six to eight weeks and then I'll go into a very structured run program for the rest of the year. Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of someone that has, let's say the person has two marathons for mm -hmm. the year and they have one marathon. They, you know, did a great job training, executed what they wanted to at the marathon. And then how long should their off season be? And before they start training for their second one of the year, because I know there's, you know, some people that are like, well, I don't want to lose the fitness that I've mm. gained for those, I don't know, five months, whatever they've, mm. four months, they put into, you know, getting fast. And if they feel like they take six to eight weeks to recover and to just do, you know, strength training stuff, they're going to lose. Is that like a different, uh, different person because they're, they have different goals or like, wh how long should theirs be, I guess? That, that's a great question because some people will do this this off season and I am combining them. I'm, I'm combining like off season and using the off season to build base so that you can move on to the next race. Mm -hmm. You can move on to that next training program, what you do in between. It is important. Um, but the uniqueness of the individual needs to be taken in, into consideration. Mm -hmm. So obviously the fitter you are, uh, your loss of, I guess, fitness uh, it's going to take a little bit longer because you're so fit and, yeah. it, and it looks different. So even people's definition of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not fit. When I look at my personal journey in just ultras, when I did my first 50 mile race, I was sore for three weeks straight, like mm -hmm. sore trouble going up and down stairs. Like I was feeling that now 50 miles could be a training run for me and I can get up the next day and go run 20 miles. Why is that? Well, it's because I have trained my body. My body has built up 
this in, incredible resilience mm-hmm. to handle that mileage. It understands that stress. And when you do something over and over and over again, your body adapts. Yeah. And so when I'm looking at a beginner marathoner and then somebody who has been marathoning for 10 years, their recovery and off season, they are going to look different mm-hmm. and they do have different needs. It's also taking um, into consideration all the other parts of their life. So somebody who is a professional marathoner, they're operating completely differently than the guy who's working 50 hours a week with three kids at home and only gets 12 hours a week to train. So that looks very different from the bachelor, uh, you know, living in a dorm Mm. and can kind of train whenever as much right? Sleeps as much as, as they want. So yes, it there, there's a lot of factors that go into our off season, our recovery and what our needs are and, and able to build back up. And that is why I started with the importance of evaluating your own body mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. What we see in the elite world, we can see very specifically that a runner who wants to hit a 230 marathon They need a a, a unique runner. They might need 120 miles a week consecutively for a while. Whereas another runner who can also hit 230 might only need 90 miles a week. Our bodies are so unique that we respond to stress, breakdown, different types of workouts differently. So we have two totally different runners that are running a, a difference of 30 miles a week but are still both able to achieve the 2.30 marathon time, both those runners are also going to recover differently as well because it just comes down to their unique needs, their efficiency in their running, how they recover. And I think that many times this is where just for most of us, we get confused and sometimes we can get down on ourselves because we're like, dude, well, my neighbor is like pumping out the marathons and like I'm taking six weeks to recover. Like I literally feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. Yeah. And I always like to say, does your neighbor live an exact replica of your life? Because if they don't, then it makes perfect sense to me that they're recovering differently from you. Mm-hmm. Because all these other factors are a part of the stress of recovery. So there's the... The, the woman who finishes the marathon and then goes home and all she's got to do is feed her cat. And then there's the woman who's finished the marathon. And I remember this when Mackenzie was born. I finished the, the Marine Corps marathon and Mackenzie was six months old screaming her brains out because she didn't take a thumb, a pacifier, or a bottle. And I nursed her right by the tree mm-hmm. at the finish line, right? Our recoveries look different, yeah right? Like that was not a peaceful way for me to start my recovery, Mm-mm. right? And neither of them is positive is more positive than the other. This is just like human life. You are in different seasons at different times. I'll tell you what, listeners, when my kids were in elementary school, my recovery, the way that I trained, my, my, my time allotted to train looked wildly different than it is now. And so I want to reiterate again the importance of the uniqueness of your specific season and assessing what it is that you need, finding out where your weaknesses are, really looking at what time and energy that you have to give to training. And you know what? For some of us, we need a longer off season. So going back to your question, Eddie, with someone that has two races Look at your two marathons and make sure, and this is advice, Mm -hmm. you know, unsolicited advice, but I'd say set yourself up to run both of those well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe, maybe you, you, these are like two dream races that you want to do, but when you finish one of them, the next one is four weeks later. Mm -hmm. Is that setting you up to be the best you can be? Some people, yeah, maybe if they've been marathoning for like 10 years, they can recover pretty quick and then maybe even run faster in that next one. Others, it's like, dude, give, give yourself a few months. Yeah, Give yourself time to completely rest. One of the things we overlook is the importance of healing from the inside. 
you know, we there's a lot of breakdown and damage that we've done to the muscles. Our overall system is is tired. It's worn down. The immune system takes a, a drop for the first 72 hours after crossing that finish line. I mean, there's there's a lot that goes on that we don't see. It isn't always just uh, whether or not you're limping and, and you feel the ache. Um, it's the fatigue of carrying out consistently a structured training program. So yeah, the off season is something that is going to be unique to you mm -hmm. and what your needs are. How can you get to the next race at your best. And I know with you, Eddie, when you, when you started, and this, I, I love this, that I, I can use this as an example. And I appreciate you being so gracious that I can talk about your marathon journey. Cause I know that it wasn't everything that you hoped it would be, but I, I do find that it is also not uncommon. Your goal was to get to the start line as strong as possible and to mm -hmm. finish the race in the best way that you possibly could. Yeah. And what we focused on for you is, was strength training. Mm -hmm. You did do a lot of strength. We did a lot of mobility. It had to be supplemental in everything that you did because even though you had this nerve issue that didn't allow you to really feel good, you knew that you could at least get your body as strong as, as possible. You maybe didn't put in all the miles that you wanted to. And I know you've said before, looking back, I'd like to log more miles before I do that distance again. But the thing is you were able to keep moving in those last final miles because you had strength. Mm -hmm. You had built up strength in your legs and in your body from head to toe. And that's ultimately what got you to the finish line. It wasn't the tempo workouts that you did. It wasn't, you know, how fast you can run a mile. And I think that that was your unique journey. So all that to say, uh, just the natural question that I'm asked is, okay, Sally, where, where do, where do I begin? Mm -hmm. Because, um, I know that I need these things. I can, you know, some of you that are running right now, some of you are, are uh, watching this on YouTube or even just driving home. What, what can I start with? Always, always start. Just don't worry about the equipment. Don't worry about like, and, and not everyone has access to a gym. I, I understand that. Not everyone has access to, to um, you know, childcare so that you can go to a gym. But I have found that even just doing body weight exercises using your own weight is a great starting point. And I am going to uh, pitch a couple of the programs that are in my app, which by the way, listeners, if you download my app, and yes, the link will be here in the, in the description, you can take a look at it for free for the first week and you can cancel it whenever you want. Uh, it's $99 for a year, but it's loaded, loaded with, so many different workouts that focus on your body head to toe. We have mobility and stretching uh, programs in there. Uh, there are some training programs in there. There is a four week and a six week run and strength program in there. And, and those pr are primarily body weight. There might be some light dumbbells, maybe a yeah. band in there. But one of the categories in there is, is a test. It's an assessment and it's very basic. I think we, I, I put in there like a, like a plank where, what's your starting point with push-ups? Are you able to do it against a wall, uh, against a table? Uh, do you do a push-up from the knee position? Can you do the push-up uh, on your feet? We assess single leg coordination and balance, squats, being able to do that single leg sit and stand. That's where you should start. You should start with you. Take, take a week and do an assessment on yourself. What's weak? What's in balance? What isn't mobile? And then you can go from there. And you can use whatever you want in my app. Eddie you actually does use the app. Uh, the, the cool feature about my app is you have access to hundreds of other trainers. So um, Eddie does, he, he has done my 30 uh, day program in the yep. past, but when he is in his gain season, um, there are some pretty legit bodybuilders that are in there that have incredible 
plans that he likes to use. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of trainers in there that um, have all different types of specialties as it comes to, I mean, there's everything from, from CrossFit to hybrid. Um, you know, there's whole programs based entirely on getting a six pack. Um, and then there's yoga and Pilates and there's prenatal programs and mom programs. And there's a lot in yeah, that app. So, um, I find the app app highly valuable. Uh, you know, you won't hurt my feelings if you're not just using my workouts, but there's stuff on nutrition and sleep and meditation. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing yeah, what you yep. get in there and you can use it wherever you go. Uh, and that is including, and most importantly, whether or not you have a gym pass or any equipment at home. And, you know, I, I know we say it all the time, but something is better than nothing and done is better than perfect. And that's one of the categories that I put in my app. Well, it's not titled that, but it's eight minute workout and quick workouts. And that is specifically for you who you want to build strength and maybe you want to take an off season right now. Um, or maybe you're in the middle of a running program right now and you're like, wow, like I, I do feel like I need to add a little bit of strength in there. There's some short little workouts that you can work into your every day. So you don't necessarily need to commit to, to uh, a structured training, but there is some supplementary uh, workouts in there that you can fit in with your running program. And then if you just want to do some type of off-season more of a lighter intensity, but you kind of do want that structure. You want someone to tell you what to do. Uh, my 30, the four week and the six week programs are great because there's three levels. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an advanced athlete, go do the beginner program. It's great. You know, a lot of the workouts in there, they're 30 to 40 minutes and it gets you out the door. It gets you moving. You get a little cardio, you get a little body strength, but it's going to set you up for a more structured regimen program uh, when you're ready. Yes, so that was uh, that was good stuff. Do you want to get into the the last part where you're uh, taking us home? Yeah, let's take it home. Let's take it home. Well, well as always, and I'm going to go ahead and and uh, just shut my my computer here. I think when strength is one of my favorite things to discuss mm -hmm. because I believe that it is a part of who we are. Yeah, as humans, we have strength is in us mentally, physically, and it looks different in all of us. It doesn't always need to be marked by bulging biceps mm -hmm. and, you know, carved out quads. Our, our strongest muscle is what is going on between our ears. And for all the years that I have been training and coaching people all the way, we're dating back to 2007. Well, actually it goes long before that because I, I trained youth uh, from the time I was in high school, college, mm -hmm. and then directly after college. This has been something that I am very grateful that I have been able to interact with people of all ages, of all levels and several different sports uh, for decades. And I cannot get away from talking about strength and building up strength without highlighting how beautiful it is that we have the ability to continue to build strength. Mm. We have the ability, you know, whether you are 10 years old, 70, 80, 90, we are able to work on getting stronger strength of mind or strength of body. Now, Eddie, you and I, we get emails weekly, we get handwritten notes, and we do talk to people who, you know, it's it's the chronic injuries, mm -hmm. it's dealing with, uh, you know, disease and, and illness, it's the frustration of, for some people that have permanent physical limitations, that don't allow them to move in the same way that they used to. And we have this ability to communicate with just people from every walk of life, from all different communities, all different seasons. And, you know, as, as someone who has been training and coaching athletes for this long, I can say to everyone that, 
regardless of how much weight you lift, regardless of how far you can run or how well you can get up the stairs or how well you can get up the mountain, the greatest strength that you have isn't going to come from your physical frame. It's the strength that you choose on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And it's how you live your life and it's how you treat other people around you. And it's in the choices that you make. Because let's be honest, for for all of us, we we do hit those seasons where, man, I just don't feel like training today. And we talked about mojo, mm -hmm. getting your mojo back. Uh, I think that was our last episode. And the challenges that we have when we rely on the feelings, the challenges that we have on wanting to feel strong 365 days a year, wanting to feel fit and injury free and fast like all the time. And that is just not the journey for any human. It never has been. We will hit seasons in our life where we are hurt physically, emotionally. We're going to get uh, sick and we're going to have uh, times where we, we, don't even, we don't have much time or energy to maybe do the things that, that we could in the past. You know, if we're used to training for two or three hours a day and now we're like, wow, I only get like 30 minutes. And so the, our ability to adapt, our ability to be flexible, our ability to figure out a new pathway, that's, that's our most powerful strength. And that's something we can always build upon. What can I do today with what I have now? And start from there. It's okay if people around you are doing, in your opinion, more than you, or lifting more than you, or moving more than you. What can you do with what you have? What can you do with what's been given to you? Because as I've reminded you many times, if you woke up this morning and you had the gift of getting on with your day, that requires strength. Hmm. It requires strength to get out of bed and get moving on in your day. And that's the most important thing that you need to do. You show up and you do life. You show up and you are present for your family, for your friends, for your, for your coworkers. And that's not measured by the size of your bicep. Hmm. We get one body. This is it. This is the machine that we were given. This is the, the, and, and all of our bodies look different and they move in different ways and have different efficiencies. And we have different weaknesses and imbalances. And, you know, there's some things that other people do just incredibly well. And, some people are faster and that's just, that's how it's been from the beginning of time. And I think the greatest strength that we can, that we can spread in all of that is, is reminding each other that, that we are strong because of who we are and uh, the purpose that we have uh, in this, in this journey. So do the best with what you have because it matters do the best with the body that's been given uniquely to you because nobody else gets to have it and nobody else um, gets to live out what is meant for you and know that Eddie and I, we are always rooting for you and we hope that you keep choosing strong in all you do. Mm -hmm.